everyone, and welcome to The Propcast. My name is Louisa Dickens, co-founder of LMR Ray and board director of the UKPA, and I shall be your weekly host. Each week for 30 minutes, we'll be connecting the VCs, prop tech startups, and real estate professionals globally, and assist in bridging that famous communication gap we all love talking about. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the PropCast. Today, we will be speaking with Barry founders, John and Noah, on how tech is revolutionizing appraisals. So welcome to the show, guys. Thank you so much. Really excited to be on. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. For those who are listening, Barry Valuation is one of the leading startups in the emerging world of real estate tech and the only company of its kind in the commercial real estate appraisal space. Their appraisers work hand in hand with the engineering, design and product teams who continuously add new features and functionality to the platform. Also, a fun fact for the listeners, they are also the first ever VC backed commercial appraisal firm having raised over, I think it's 30 million in the past three plus years. Now powered by big data, advanced technology and extensive expertise, Barry is redefining the entire commercial appraisal space. And so you all have a, uh, a brief sort of introduction to two or three founders that we're speaking with today. Prior to co-founding Barry, John worked at Lightning Group, now BBG, the largest independent appraisal firm in New York City. In his four plus years there, he valued over $3 billion worth of commercial property across all asset types. And frustrated with the antiquated process of appraising, but excited by the need for a better solution, he left to start Barry with Noah and sees it in June of 2015. John graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with a degree in US history, and he still aspires to become a chef, a filmmaker, and the first left-handed shortstop for the San Francisco Giants. So welcome to the show, John. I'm looking forward to hearing about your chef ambitions later. (laughs) Sounds good. I appreciate it. (laughs) Now for Noah's background, before co-founder Barry, Noah also worked for BBG, valuing over 2.5 billions worth of commercial real estate in New York. So not short, not short of um, what John did and three billion. Sure, a bit of competition there. <laughs> um, I worked okay. a little bit longer than he did. <laughs> <laughs> in 2010, he started his career in baseball operations, money balling for the Toronto Blue Jays. Noah graduated from McGill University with a major in statistics and a double minor in operations management and labor management relations. He has on multiple occasions lectured at Columbia University with a primary focus on prop tech and the future of real estate. Noah loves numbers, all things state related and scones, or maybe you pronounce it scones? <laughs> scones, yeah. I don't um, care how it's pronounced, it's more <laughs> But no, both of you, welcome welcome to the show. Let's start with, John, how about you talk us through the Barry journey? You know, how did you get to where you are today? Yeah, I would say it's a story about getting lucky a lot of different times, first and foremost, mostly through the people we've met uh, and who've kind of decided to, to come on and do this with us. But yeah, I mean, it was not, I would not say the appraisal aspect of, of the story is like a super intentional one. I, I fell into this space like kind of a little bit randomly out of college. I was always you know, kind of a generalist in school and wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do with my life. And I had kind of thoughts of going to law school as an undergrad. And you know, I like did debate in high school and studied US history. And But my parents are both lawyers and talked me out of going straight to law school out of college. I, I don't think it was like my lifelong passion in the same way like medicine, for example, was for my sister who wanted to be a doctor since she was nine years old. So I had, I'm from California originally. Noah and I grew up together in Berkeley. And I fell in love with New York City, visiting on weekends when I was at Penn. And so really kind of was looking for, for a job in New York and, and really kind of wasn't sure exactly, you know, what I wanted to be doing and, and was kind of avoiding the kind of traditional investment banking route that a lot of my friends were going down. And so started applying to some startups and like some consulting firms. And like very, very early on in that process, like kind of beginning in my senior year in college, a friend of mine from school called me up to try to recruit me for this commercial appraisal firm that he was working at, which, you know, at the time was, was the largest independent firm in New York city, but it was still like a 20 or 25 person company. That's a very, very fragmented space. And so I didn't really know much about appraisals or realistically commercial real estate at all. I was taking an architecture class at the time that was like kind of focused on, on modern architecture and a lot of New York city properties. And so that had kind of piqued my interest and, you know, came up to interview and, you know, the owners kind of pitched to us was, was that, you know, the appraisal space is maybe not one that 
we were super familiar with, but it's an amazing kind of foundational education to get in commercial real estate. Like what we're doing is we're valuing, you know, every commercial asset you can think of in the largest real estate market in the country, you know, every day as appraisers, uh, you know, 22 years old, right out of college, we're talking to lenders, developers, brokers. So kind of building a lot of connections in the space and, you know, really kind of understanding ultimately the underlying value of all of these assets, which is, you know, a super valuable thing if you want to get into development later on or lending, whatever it is within real estate. So I ended up taking that job out of school. And then six months in, I ended up recruiting Noah in the similar way that my friend from school recruited me. And so we were there together for, I was there for four years, you know, Noah was there for three and a half years. And, you know, pretty quickly, we were frustrated with the tools that we had to do our jobs from a technological standpoint. There's not been a lot of innovation in the space in the past like 20, 30 years. And so pretty much kind of industry standard was, was Word and Excel. And, and that was the extent of the <laughs> tech that we had. And so, you know, you're taking this Excel sheet, which is a, a template basically from, you know, previous reports. That's like 50 different tabs filled with data from, you know, God knows how many other buildings have been kind of built on top of the same template. That Excel is linked to a Word document, which is a 120 page, you know, plus appraisal report written about a totally different building. And there's just a huge amount of kind of like manual data entry, basically kind of working through this Excel and Word doc to kind of create your new appraisal, but also a huge amount of risk for errors and inconsistencies because, you know, one, you know, hidden row in your Excel or hard-coded cell and your value of the property can be off by millions of dollars. And then you're going through a 120 you know, page Word document that's written about a completely different building and trying to kind of update that and turn it into a new appraisal. But it just leads to a huge amount of errors, inefficiencies and consistencies. So like these reports take like you know, three, four weeks to be delivered a huge amount of back and forth clients. We're kind of like the risk layer for lenders for putting out millions of dollars worth of loans. And so if there's uh, inaccuracies in the appraisal that can ha have you know huge implications and, and that's happening all the time. And so Noah and I you know, kind of had this idea in our heads of starting something on our own for a long time. Our, our mm -hmm. first entrepreneurial pursuit was after our sophomore year in college, we started a, a baseball scouting website. Noah put 10,000 miles on his, on his parents, old Volvo driving up and down <laughs> different cities in California. And, and, you know, he leveraged that to get this job with the Blue Jays, which you know, he can talk about. But I guess that was kind of when we first got the idea of, of wanting to do something on our own. And, you know, we were really interested in the food space. So there's, there's a lot of ideas that revolved around food and restaurants. We wrote a screenplay at one point on the side <laughs> after, after work, but th this idea was always kind of staring, staring us in the face. You know, we were living together and working together at the time and on our walks home, just kind of talking about you know, kind of our dream technology and, and what we could do if we kind of built something in a modern tech stack for, for this industry that, you know, hasn't really seen that before. And so after, uh, you know, three and a half years working there together, we'd saved up enough money and, and kind of built up enough expertise within the appraisal space to you know, pursue this idea. And, and for us, you know, it started with technology, but when we thought about actually, you know, staying in the appraisal industry and doing something on our own, we realized there's so many other aspects of an appraisal firm that, that we can change and make different and hopefully make better you know, not just from a tech standpoint, but from a, a you know, operational standpoint, culture is a, a huge one. You know, our company, mm -hmm. when we were there, sold for $20 million and one person got $20 million and all the people that had been putting, you know, many, many late nights in for many years, got nothing from that. And so, you know, obviously it was really important for us to, you know, build a company that everyone has equity in and kind of build something, you know, in a shared vision with our team. And so, you know, kind of this, there's been so many kind of exciting parts of this journey beyond just the tech idea and kind of building a truly new kind of modern appraisal firm. But uh, so we, we, we quit our jobs in 2015. The, the first, you know, really, really lucky thing that happened was, was meeting our third co-founder, Caesar, who we truly could not have done this without through a friend of mine from school. And, you know, he had a, he had a small development firm and, you know, he was an engineer. He was our year at Princeton and, and him and three other guys had this development firm where they did like contract work and took on some side projects like ours. And so we started working together uh, for about a year and then, and then he came on full time and left that firm to join us as our third co-founder and our CTO. And so that was in summer 2016. Uh, we then got into the Metaprop Accelerator. We were in their second class in New York City. I uh, went through that you know, six month process and then came out of that and, and looked to raise a seed round. And so we raised our seed round in, in May of 2017. Uh, and that was when the next really, really fortunate thing happened, which was meeting our COO and chief appraiser, James Dunn somehow convinced him to leave CBRE, which is the largest appraisal firm in the world, where he you know, was a VP, had a team, was kind of an emerging star there. And then he came to join a company of three people, zero revenue and zero clients. And you know, that was the, 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 the really crucial step for us because we are a tech-enabled appraisal firm. And so in order to be that, we needed, we needed that experienced appraiser uh, who has his MAI. He, James had been in commercial real estate in New York for 16 years at that point in, in the appraisal in Super 10. And so in, in summer of 2017, launched our actual business, 
And so in the past, you know, three and a half years since then, uh, we've grown, I think, pretty significantly. We have now a second office in DC. We've raised a little over $30 million um, and now kind of focused on, on national expansion over the next you know, two or three years. Woo. Well, that's that's some journey, John. Now, what? so there's obviously three founders, uh, you mentioned obviously, C's. what, obviously in any sort of startup business, as a senior management, you, everyone has their, their different sort of skill sets. To so me and my co-founder, Brad, I'm more, God, he's hate me saying this, but I'm more sort of more client facing business development. He's very much operations and a lot significantly more technical than I'm and way better at fine, the financial side. What is, and maybe uh, no, this question for you, what is everyone's, what are your different sort of roles that you play? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that part of what makes the partnership work so well for myself and John is that we are very similar. And we have very similar skill sets, but also to your point, uh, it sort of poses a challenge as you become leaders in a business, it's more efficient to divide and conquer in a lot of ways. So John has really taken on the responsibility of sales and recruiting, and it's oftentimes more external facing. I think he's done a pretty unbelievable job recruiting, like the people that we've been able to attract are not only just like so smart and dynamic and like the associates that were hiring out of college, I would never get a job at Bowery, full stop. (laughs) And they're also just like amazing people. Like we were in the car the other day, just talking about like a lot of the nicest people we've met work at Bowery. And I think that's a lot of, a lot of our success. I mean, really all of our success is due to the people that we've attracted. So just, always in awe at John's ability to bring incredible people in. My side is more on the finance, accounting, operations, and product side. So I oversee our finance department. I you know, have weekly meetings with our head of product. I have daily meetings with Caesar, our co-founder, and really just trying to understand how we can alleviate all the pain points that the people John is bringing in and eventually you know those two things come together and build something that we believe can be really powerful and so you both quit your jobs what in 20 fiscal you know starting off at your own business after being part of a bigger firm is always a risk i mean it's extremely exciting but it's always a risk now a lot of our listeners are founders or potential founders or also people come from the real estate industry or outside you know with these fantastic ideas of disruption can you how how did you sort of approach that you know you know can you explain how you got the business from just an idea to actually building something because that's it's a matter you your business has changed so much since you know 2015 maybe this one for you john yeah i mean i would say the the quitting and living in new york city making no money for a year and a half was probably not as like thought out and planned out as it probably should have been. And we <laughs> the got, most expensive we, we were, city in the world. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, we had, we had saved up a little bit of money from, from our, our time appraising there for four years. You know, at that point also, we needed, we needed a change. We were, we were pretty burnt out. The, the way our old firm worked, it was, it was very, very siloed, you know, and just kind of coming in every day and just like grinding and writing these appraisal reports without a connection to the, really the organization. We were, we were on fee split getting kind of a percentage of our fees for each of these jobs. And you can only do that for so long. And so that's a huge part of how we think about, you know, building a different culture and setting up a compensation structure that has a really sizable equity component to it that really connects people with the larger vision of what we're trying to do here. And so we were at a point, you know, in, in 2015 where if it wasn't this, it, was, it had to be something else. But this idea was one that was really exciting for us. And obviously meeting Caesar you know, made it kind of possible. And so, you know, we really focused the first two years. I think we had a kind of notably long you know, product development cycle uh, for a new startup because of the complexity of the tech that we were building. You know, there was a very, very high bar for what it meant to be kind of ready to launch because we're creating reports that go to banks and, you know, large financial institutions that are relying on these reports to make out, to put out millions of dollars for these, for these loans. And so spent, you know, two years really kind of building out the tech until we were re- felt we were ready to, to launch our actual business. And so we're kind of bouncing around coffee shops in these village, me, Noah and Caesar, and kind of building out kind of our dream software for ourselves. And, you know, Noah and I, as appraisers, were kind of conceiving of, of what was required and Noah and, and Caesar was what executing on that from a tech standpoint. 
And then, you know, raising that seed round of capital in May 2017, you know, I think Metaprop was really helpful with kind of making a lot of introductions in the VC world, kind of taking us from, you know, outsiders in the space that really kind of knew appraisals and, and had this idea to kind of insiders within this kind of new emerging prop tech world. And, you know, for us, it was, it was really exciting to see the reception we got from venture capitalists that I think had seen a lot of other industries have similar transformations to the one we're trying to take in the appraisal world, mm. but no one was doing it within appraisals. And so thankfully, uh, a few investors believed in us uh, as the ones that could kind of drive this, this change in the industry. And, and then meeting James and having James come over from CBRE was, was the last like really you know, crucial leap there for us to actually launch that business. And then, you know, for us, you know, the initial sales were, were challenging because it, we play in a world of, of pretty risk averse institutions, rightfully so. And so being a new appraisal firm, you know, a lot of clients don't want to be the guinea pig on that. But thankfully, we had built up uh, enough kind of connections and trust in the industry of, you know, certain individuals at lenders we'd work with a lot. You know, James, when he was at CBRE, you Noah and I, when we were at Lightner Group and, you know, a few clients, you know, kind of gave us a shot and then just started kind of building from there. I was going to say it always helps when you have, so, well, I guess you have both of you who truly understand your value proposition. So when getting your product into said business, whatever it could be, that must help. What would you, is there a particular client, which, you know, maybe it's could be one of your biggest clients you've won over, is that that you got into? What's uh, your biggest success to date or one of your biggest success to date, Noah? Yeah, I wouldn't say there's one client. I mean, we work with a lot of national lenders from, you know, Wells Fargo, Capital One, First Republic, all the way down to smaller players. I think the biggest success is just, I mean, I touched on this earlier, the talent that we've been able to attract. I think if you are able to attract a lot of smart, ambitious people and put a problem in front of them, it's pretty incredible what they're able to achieve. But that was always... That was always the question. It's like, are we going to be able to get people to sort of follow this vision? And we've been able to do it to date. And it's still a challenge. I mean, finding the people are everything. And being able to convince people um, to follow you is, is everything. And I think that's, that's been by far our, most achievement, or our biggest achievement. And I think when you talk to people at Bowery, they'll tell you the same thing. Yeah. Like what really, the magic is the people that work here. And yeah, we cry, we cry a lot at, at our all hands at holiday <laughs> parties. So when we, when we look out at the room and, and see the people that are, are doing this with us. I mean, it's insane. I'd love to hear on your um, website and sort of talking to, oh, there's people I know in the industry, they um, talk about your culture. How do you create the right culture? Uh, it's not easy. Lots of, lots of our audience listening and it's a question that gets emailed in quite a lot. What, how, how do you create a healthy, happy culture in a, no doubt any startup is a chaotic, stressful, yet fun environment? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say that there's no saturation on good culture, right? Like, I think that we have a great culture, but there's so much more that we can do. I think early on, John and I were very intentional about having gratitude be sort of a core value that we built mm. our culture, culture around. At our last job, we didn't really feel valued in a lot of ways. Like yeah. that was something that was really missing. And we wanted to make sure that, you know, when someone decides to take a risk and join your company or when they, you know, wake up every morning and decide to come work at Bowery, we're hiring really capable people. They don't have to work at Bowery. And to not see that and appreciate that is to take them for granted. And I think that it's just such an amazing gift and it's, it's something that is contagious. So I would say that, uh, I mean, truthfully, a lot of our culture is just sort of accidental and we've spent a lot of time as we've grown being more and more intentional. But from day one, we wanted to make sure that this was a place where people were going to work hard, but we're going to be deeply appreciated for all of that hard work. Position yourself to thrive with a five-week course that covers the essentials of designing, developing, marketing, and operating offices in 2021 and beyond. Check out the Future Proof Office course at realinnovationacademy.com. Quote LMRE for a 10% discount. 
Now, stepping aside from the culture, and it obviously sounds like a pretty epic place to work, especially if you have two good friends starting a business. It's always going to be a fun environment. Let's talk, a little, <laughs> let's talk a little bit more about your end product and how your product has probably changed a l- significantly since you first started the business. And maybe we'd love to hear a little bit more about what you have planned for 2021. Do you, who wants to go first? Let's know it. The product man, do you want to go? <laughs> yeah, no, all you. Uh, oh, thank you. I get the easy ones here. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the product, it's changed so much. We, we to, you know, John was talking about this earlier for a couple of years. It was just John and myself as essentially product people and Caesar as the lone engineer. And we spent a couple of years designing something that we thought made a lot of sense, but I mean, really in sort of the lean startup model, you want to get the minimum viable prototype or product out as quickly as possible. So we spent two years developing this MVP. And when we got it out into the real world, there are so many different edge cases, especially within commercial real estate and especially in New York, which is you know, arguably the most challenging geographic to actually value properties within. Um, And so we spent a lot of time just, you know, solving pain points for different edge cases that we would encounter. And so getting all that live ammunition, being able to actually work with lenders, get their feedback, being able to bring on appraisers was hugely helpful. And we built something that was incredibly powerful within New York and New Jersey for multifamily and mixed use assets. And over the last year, we've been looking to really expand the product to something that's more geographically agnostic and more asset agnostic as well. So now we're at a place where we're appraising every single asset type. We've worked in over 30 states in the US and we're just making sure that our product has the infrastructure to support all those geographies and all of those asset types. Meanwhile, our engineering team is massive. I mean, we've got over 35 people working in product design and engineering. So wow. the, the rate of delivery has also accelerated quite a bit. And, and, and we have like, a, and we have one, I think pretty significant advantage on the product side, which is that we're building a tool for ourselves internally today. There will be a tool ultimately kind of down the road that interfaces with directly with our clients. And so, you know, that is, that is certainly on a roadmap, but today, our technology is is used by our appraisers who are on our staff. And so there's that really powerful feedback loop between the, our actual colleagues of, you know, it was originally kind of Noah and I designing our dream software for ourselves as appraisers. Now it's our entire, you know, 40 plus person appraisal team working directly with their colleagues who, you know, I guess now they virtually sit next to each other, but, you know, in, in, in the pre-COVID world, we're literally sitting next to our product design and engineering team and designing this, this software together. And so, you know, I think that that internal feedback loop has been really powerful for us in terms of, you know, being able to deliver things quickly. I swear that's a client's often biggest frustrations is not having a product that can sort of change and fit what their needs are. You mentioned, obviously, the COVID word. How for your business, obviously not being able to sit next to your, you know, product design team. Other than that, you know, how how has it impacted your business and what have you done to like maybe surely is your product has to ch- had to change for the market or surely it's fairly resilient? Yeah. I mean, the product was actually, the fact that we have a cloud-based system has been hugely valuable. Like I can look, I mean, I can, everything is cloud-based. So, you know, we, you know, database all of our data and Dropbox. We use Salesforce for our operating system as a company, our, appraisal writing platform is all in the cloud. And so that that makes it very easy for us to be remote. And so in a lot of ways, nothing changed. And a lot of the work that we had done enabled that when we hit COVID. And in terms of, so if we're looking at 2021, so you're in 30 states, obviously perfecting your product is, is, can your product be replicated in um, other countries or, I mean, over here in the UK, I know a couple of firms who do doing it, but none which, yeah, which are particularly sort of grown. And there's definitely a gap in the market for it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. We so we've only focused in New York and DC, 
And we've only gone after clients in those markets. But because of the level of service that we're able to provide, we have clients that have asked us to work in you know, over 30 different states. So our focus really to date has been in just those two geographies. As we look to next year, we want to expand geographically. But valuation and appraisal is a global industry. Mm. And it is a pain that is felt all over the world. So, uh, you know, we met with, you know, Cushman Wakefield's head of Europe and their pain points are the same pain points we face here. And it's the same exact methodology. We're actually, you know, talking to a appraiser now who works in Canada and the governing body in the U.S. is called USPAP and the governing body in Canada is called CUSPAP and they have been harmonized and it's very much the same problem set. So we see Bowery as, you know, as potentially a global company, and that's what we're working towards. John actually gave a talk. I mean, John, if you want to talk about, you gave a talk to a bunch of Japanese bankers. Yeah. I mean, they were like, when can you be in Tokyo? I'm like, trust me, I want to be in Tokyo. (laughs) (laughs) So going truly global. Well, let's hope we can all start traveling again. And um, absolutely. Outside of revolutionizing appraisals, you know, going global, talk to us a little bit more how you both spend your spare time, if you do have any spare time. But John, you mentioned you'd like to be a chef, among many other things, since lockdown. Is, how have your culinary skills come on? Is there a particular dish you started cooking or, you know, talk us through that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the increased cooking has been one of the few positives of COVID for me, definitely been cooking a lot more, which is really nice. I, I really, I love like seafood and shellfish. I make a lot of uh, like spaghetti with clams and other, other dishes in the, in the shellfish world. But yeah, I mean, been, I, I'm like food and film are kind of like my, my real passions in life outside of, outside of work. And so COVID has only enhanced that time in terms of <laughs> movies being watched and, <laughs> and cooking. I think there's a lot of other things I, I really do miss that I can't do anymore from COVID, such as traveling and, and seeing friends and things like that. But, <laughs> Human uh, interaction. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but, but the cooking part's been really nice. Uh, you say you love scones, such scones, very British of you. <laughs> Tell, talk us, what, what do you have with them? Do you have the cream and jam or what do you have? <laughs> there's, uh, there's actually this bakery in Berkeley, California, where John and I grew up called The Cheese Board. And it's, you know, this really important institution in Berkeley, Chez Panisse, which is, you know, sort of the creator of California cuisine. And I guess now it's called New American Cuisine, moved across the street just to be close to cheese board. And this is back in the (laughs) early seventies. And they, I mean, they make a number of scones and I just have them straight, but it is one of my great joys to sit outside of cheese board and have, you know, one of their cold brews and eat one of their scones. It's a pretty amazing thing. (laughs) I, I absolutely love Paris and France, but I stand by that the best baguette I've ever had in my life is from cheese board. (laughs) <laughs> when you're out here, when it's safe to travel, uh, we'll have to take you on a tour. But. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> Whenever that will be. Look, guys, we're unfortunately coming to the end of the podcast. Tell, please let us know the audience, you know, the best way for them to connect with you and Barry and John, if you want to go first. Yeah, I mean, so the best way to connect with, with me, I guess, would be to send me an email. My email is john at barryevaluation.com. I'm slow to reply. I apologize. But that is, that is certainly the easiest way to connect with me. Yeah, e- email as well. And even as I'm saying this, it's like this is such a, you know, obvious indication of how antiquated our industry is. I don't know if people have, you know, Twitter or Instagram or anything like that. So I feel like I'm part of the problem as well. But the best way to reach me is Noah at BoweryEvaluation.com. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, guys. And also, audience, if you just probably catch them at the bakery, they'll probably be lurking about them as well. <laughs> <laughs> Forget hanging out their mouth. Um, look, uh, thank you guys for joining us on the podcast. And I'm looking forward to catching up with you after the show. Absolutely. Thank, thank you so much for having us. us. Thank you for joining us this week on the podcast. And a big thanks to our special guests. Make sure you visit our website, www.nmre.co.uk, where you can subscribe to our show or you'll find us on iTunes and Spotify where all good content is found. 
Whilst you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate if you could rate and review us on iTunes, or if you simply just spread the word. Be sure to tune in next Tuesday, and I'll catch you later. Hi, this is Nelson from Property Quants. I'd like to invite you to join our Introduction to Data Science and Machine Learning for Real Estate seminar. To learn more, visit propertyquants.com slash seminar. And use special code LMRE20 on Eventbrite for a discount. You're listening to a podcast company podcast. This was made by Podcast Syndicator, where we help you go from start to grow to making money with your podcast. Let us help you share your message and your voice with the world. Reach out now, Jason at podcastsyndicator.com or Brett at podcastsyndicator.com to find out more. Thank you for listening and do come back to hear nothing but the best podcasts.